Welcome back to Jersey Matters. I'm Larry Menti. We continue our conversation now with New Jersey Health Commissioner Sharif El Nahal. I want to talk about marijuana, as I said, as we ended the last segment. And I think when you talk about marijuana, you have to talk about mm. two separate things, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. So let's start with medical marijuana, sure. because I believe there have been some difficulties in the past in New Jersey in access to medical marijuana for those who need it. Mm. That changed with the new administration. Do you believe New Jersey is where it should be now? Not yet, but we're working very fast to make sure we get there. Uh, we've already doubled the number of patients uh, since the beginning of the administration who qualify for medical marijuana based on the fact that we've added a number of new conditions for which there is evidence that medical marijuana works, such as chronic pain, anxiety, and a number of other conditions. And we want to make sure that the supply of all of that catches up with the demand where you have a lot of patients enrolling. So we actually have an open application process now for six additional alternative treatment centers. That's the dispensary that actually allows you to get the uh, therapy. It's similar to a pharmacy. And we regulate that. We want to make sure that there's enough supply to meet that demand. So we anticipate the demand will be a lot more than it is right now. We're right around the 35,000 range in terms of patients. And we're really gearing up to get there. Are there some misconceptions on medical marijuana and, uh, and how it can be accessed and what it can be used for? I think there's been a stigma among not only the general population, but in the medical community in particular. And you actually have this phenomenon where a lot of patients are educating their doctors about uh, the benefits of medical marijuana and asking them to enroll as physicians who can uh, recommend it. We actually want to reverse that trend. We want uh, physicians and the medical community to know that it's a legitimate option to treat many other conditions and it's yet another tool in their tool belt to treat chronic conditions. And in many cases, in most cases, it's not you know, passing a joint or, or it, it, it's the oil that is, for instance, I, I had a friend of mine who's, whose husband uh, had brain cancer and they, and they were desperately trying to get this oil that would relieve yeah. some pain. That's the misconception I was talking about. Absolutely. It comes in a lot of formulations and comes in lozenges, ointments, creams, as you mentioned. Uh, it does come in the bud, with a lot of, which a lot of people actually uh, make into an oil using machines that you can buy at alternative treatment centers. So the way it's given medicinally can actually look like many of the other medications you take every day. So you have no concerns about medical marijuana whatsoever? Just that we need to catch up with uh, the number of people who could benefit and get it to them uh, as an option. Do you have concerns about recreational marijuana? Well, recreational marijuana for adult use, that argument is there uh, for uh, social justice reasons primarily. Uh, that's the, been the governor's position on that. Uh, I will say as a public health department, we're going to have to get out in front in terms of the risks uh, getting the word out about not smoking and driving, uh, making sure that law enforcement and first responders are prepared to be able to recognize uh, somebody impaired or somebody who uh, has reached a point, for example, while driving where they can't uh, see what they're doing, sort of like drunk driving. Uh, all of that will be part of our role as the public health agency in the state to make sure those risks are aware to people, uh, uh, people are aware of those risks so that they don't uh, take risks inappropriately. And until that happens, until people are aware of those risks, until law enforcement is able to effectively tell if somebody is too high to drive or shouldn't be driving, it shouldn't happen? Well, what we're saying is we want to learn from the states that have already done this. So there was an uptick in car accidents, for example, in the state of Colorado. Uh, they have uh, a lot of collaborations with our medical marijuana department, and we're learning from them. Uh, there's mistakes that we shouldn't make when we start rolling this out. So we will have an important public health role uh, and we will continue that role uh, in the event of adult use uh, marijuana and again we will still continue to offer medical marijuana. You're concerned about uh, children having access in the house to the marijuana because there there has been some studies on the effect of a child's brain. Uh, that is a significant risk of course uh, with development, brain development of young children uh, we discourage even medical marijuana use in pregnant women for that reason uh, because it does uh, affect the fetus uh, with different evaluations that have been done. Uh, so of course there's a concern broadly uh, that we want to keep it out of the hands of children uh, and we need to take every step that we can to make sure that doesn't happen. So it shouldn't be in candy form whatsoever? Uh, that would be something that I would personally oppose because uh, again these types of forms of it are more accessible to children, children may not know. Uh, but we'll see how uh, it plays out. We don't have a bill yet to look at in terms of adult use. Uh, but again, just to reinforce, the 
motivation behind adult use marijuana in terms of the governor's positioning and our administration broadly is one of social justice. Right, yes, but there's still, I mean, you say, you say that and I understand that is the argument, I get that, but the, if there are health concerns, you have an important role to play. Absolutely. That, that's all I wanted to make certain of. Uh, one last thing, and I know it's important to you, so I want to bring it up. The, the infant mortality rate in New Jersey is pretty good compared to the rest of the country, yes. so you should feel good about that. However, you have been out on front, in front in complaining uh, or raising the concern that there is a disparity among races. Uh, is it a racial thing or is it an economic thing? It's actually a racial thing. So if you look at the disparities for uh, black infants versus the general population and compare that disparity to other races, you don't see nearly as big of a gap. For communities of color, particularly black communities, that disparity is inexcusably high. We have the biggest disparity among the biggest uh, between black infant mortality and the general population across the country. So it's absolutely something we have to get in front of, and yes, the risk in particular is for African Americans. You said inexcusable, which is a strong word, which means something must be done about it. What? And something can be done, and by the way, the First Lady has been an incredible leader in this area. Uh, the important first thing to do is to actually go out to these communities proactively. That hasn't been done as much as it should be. We've had uh, funding from the CDC, other federal entities that has uh, a lot been allotted to improve pregnancy outcomes. That was done in a less of a targeted way before. We've in particular targeted communities of color where this disparity is the worst. And we've rebranded this program called Healthy Women, Healthy Families to make sure that we're getting community health workers and institutions of trust, churches, community centers, other areas to really bring as many pregnant women as possible or women thinking about becoming pregnant into prenatal care to get uh, the right resources and make sure all the resources available to them are communicated. Wonderful, thank you. Always appreciate your time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. New Jersey Health Commissioner Sharif Eldahal. Jersey Matters continues right after this.